Hey Instagram, how's it going? I hope you're really, really well. I am so excited to be live with you today. As part of Mental Health Awareness Month, I am so grateful and honored that I've joined NAMI as an ambassador, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I'm so grateful for the work they're doing, the resources they're providing, the services that they're offering. And I want all of you, if you have a friend or family member or anyone in your life that's struggling with their mental health, I want them to head over to this address. It's not letting me post the comment that I really wanted to post, but I'm going to type one in because that's the best I can do right now. I will share the full comment later. I wanted you all to know that if you know anyone who's struggling, if you're struggling, then please head over to nami.org forward slash help. This is a mental health special live. I'm bringing on a very special guest, which I'm just gonna bring on right now. And let's see, where are you, Nami? Are you here? Please let me know when you're here. There we go. Thank you, everyone who's here right now. <laughs> Eva goes, pause your podcast to join your live. I love that. Thanks for being here. How's everyone doing? Here we go. Hello, Dr. Christine. Dean Crawford, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I am so well, I'm so well. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so grateful to introduce you to my community, everyone. This is Dr. Christine Crawford, who's an adult and child psychiatrist based in Boston and the Associate Medical Director for NAMI, which I'm so grateful to have partnered up with. Christine, are you in Boston right now or are you traveling? I'm in Boston right now, yes. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. Well, everyone's going to have lots of questions. I've got lots of questions and I thought we should dive straight in. I want to start off with something that NAMI is encouraging us all to do this month, which is taking a moment, uh, taking a moment today, something that we haven't been doing for a long time, something we might forget to do. I wanted to ask you, how are you taking a moment during Mental Health Awareness Month? Yeah, I'm just trying to find pockets of time where I can just disconnect from my phone from my emails and connect with myself because I find that I'm always on the go, always doing things, but I've been carving out like five minutes a day just to be alone with my thoughts, just to breathe, just to focus on my body, which sounds like it could be an easy thing to do, just five minutes, but the way that we live our lives is so hard to find five minutes for yourself. So that's what I've been prioritizing this month. Actually, the last couple of days, but I want to make it a habit for sure. Absolutely. That's amazing. I love hearing that. And I think it's so interesting that habits can form so quickly and they also form over time. And I think this month is a great month for all of us to form a new habit. I think you've just made me think about that, the idea that if your mental health is something that you struggle with all year round, this is a great month to lock in and take that mental health diet seriously, whether it's what you're consuming, whether, as Dr. Christine said, how much time you're spending on your phone, whether it's being able to just take a moment to breathe. Uh, I think it's so powerful to do that. So I wanna thank you all, whoever's tuning in right now, thank you for taking a moment with both of us. Uh, Dr. Christine, I think there's so many things to talk about. I think one of the things is, we know the stats say that one in five uh, US adults experience mental illness each year, but only half receive treatment. And I think there are a lot of blocks to that treatment. What are some of the blocks that you see? Uh, one of the ones that I see and notice is some people are just unaware. We don't recognize that we may be struggling and that we're worthy of finding help and support. We think, oh, this is something that will just go away or it's just a short term thing. And sometimes I don't think we know where to turn. What are some of the blocks that you see to finding that help? I think you bring up a good point that people have difficulty recognizing and identifying some of the symptoms of mental health related concerns. People often think that you have to have symptoms of depression for months and months and months before you receive treatment. But not a lot of people know that it just takes two weeks of experiencing periods of low mood, poor sleep, changes in your appetite, and difficulty functioning that would warrant you to actually seek out formal treatment for depression. 
or anxiety. People experience anxiety all the time, but it could be hard for them to recognize when it's getting in the way of their day-to-day -day activities. We've been so used to normalizing distress that it's hard for us to recognize when the distress is too much for us to handle. So you bring up a good point. Recognition is hard for all of us. That's why having these conversations is so important so that people can be aware of some of the signs and symptoms for a mental health condition. And then once you finally notice, ah, something is off, I'm not functioning, the anxiety is getting in the way, it can feel really complicated to figure out where do you go to turn to help? Who do you talk to? What's covered by insurance? What isn't covered by insurance? The mental health system is so complicated that people don't know where to start. And that's why I love organizations like NAMI, because if you don't know where to go, if you don't know where to turn, NAMI is a great place to look towards if you're experiencing any sort of symptoms of mental health related concerns. Absolutely. Could you tell us about some of those services and offerings that NAMI has that allows those things to become more accessible? Because I too agree with this. I think that we are talking more about mental health. I know that on my podcast on purpose, we're trying to destigmatize it. We have amazing experts, athletes, individuals, artists, and doctors who come and share therapists who talk about the importance. But then I think people think, well, where do I start? Where do I go? So what are some of those services and offerings that NAMI has that people should take advantage of? Yes. So NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and it's the largest grassroots organization that's dedicated to improving the lives of individuals living with mental health conditions. What we're really big on is people with lived experience are the experts. So I appreciate all the resources in which there are clinical experts that are involved, but NAMI, we have people who are living this and who are on this mental health journey each and every day. So it's an incredible resource to tap into, to have a sense of community of other people who've gone through this. So we have support groups that are available, not only for people who are experiencing mental health related issues, but also for their caregivers so that their loved ones, their family, their friends have access to the resources and tools that they need to better support the loved one who's experiencing mental health concerns. We're also big on education. How do you go and get treatment? What to expect from treatment and what does treatment look like? So it's a great community of resources to learn about where to start, to talk to people who live this each and every day so that you don't feel alone. And so that's the biggest thing because people feel alone in having these experiences of depression, anxiety, or other more serious mental health concerns. But NAMI tells people you are not alone in this and we are a community that wraps its arms around people who are going through this experience. Yeah, I think one of the things, Dr. Christine, that you just pointed out there is I think a lot of people do feel alone and a lot of people don't know how to tell their friends. And a lot of us don't even know how to be there for someone else when they're going through something like this. If someone has a friend in their life that may be going through something, maybe you're sitting there wondering whether you're like, I'm not sure and I don't know how to start the conversation. I don't wanna make them feel uncomfortable, but I want to be there for them. What have you seen as good approaches to helping a friend, helping a family member have this conversation, which can be quite uncomfortable and awkward for them and difficult for them if they haven't been open to it before? I think it's, a couple, I think it's important to think of a couple of things. Number one, you don't have to get it right and you don't have to be perfect when it comes to engaging in a conversation with your loved one about this. Oftentimes people feel like they have to prepare, they have to read up about how they should navigate the conversation. But really the conversation should be an opportunity for connection. So really kind of dive into the conversation, hoping to connect with your loved one. The second thing to focus on is to be curious about your loved one's experience and to not make any assumptions or assign judgment to what it is you've noticed as it relates to their emotional state or their behavior. So leaning in with curiosity can look like, you know, I noticed some changes over the last couple of weeks. You're not um, going out as often. You're not returning my phone calls. I'm just curious, what do you think might be behind that? Rather than saying to your friend, I think you're depressed, you're not answering your mm. phone, what's going on? So we need to connect with our loved ones. We need to be curious 
And we also need to not engage in problem solving for them, but help them problem solve ways and opportunities that they can get the help that they need. So what that looks like is, well, I wonder, are there things that you've thought about to kind of help you deal with the anxiety, to help you deal with this period of time, rather than saying, you need to go to therapy now, you need to be on meds, no they probably already thought about a whole list of different opportunities, but really your job is to support them in gaining access to the resources that they need rather than solving the problem for them, at least in those initial conversations as you're learning more about their experience. I love that advice. I love that advice, Dr. Christina. I think it's so practical. It's so easy. It kind of takes it down a notch because we can take it so seriously and we can approach it quite aggressively and we can put someone on the defensive quite early and so i love those approaches that you've shared and anyone who's listening or watching and has been trying to avoid having one of those tough or difficult conversations i hope that that's helping you move in that direction uh, dr christine what else are you hearing and seeing from people when you're speaking to people who are struggling with their mental health you know you're you're doing this every single day what are some of the things you're hearing what are the most common questions you get asked yeah, so people are often wondering if they should disclose their mental health um, challenges to those around them. Should they share it with their bosses? Should they share it with their, um, their friends? Should they share with certain family members who may not understand their challenges? And I oftentimes um, tell people to do what they think is best for them given their unique situation. I'm not in the habit of making blanket statements to people saying, you have to tell your boss immediately, but rather it's providing them with support on how to navigate some of these conversations that they anticipate having, providing them with scripts that they can use and even practice leading up to a conversation that they could have with someone. So if you need to talk to your boss about some of your mental health challenges because you're missing days from work or you need to take time off to go to, to therapy, to think ahead of what it is that you would say to your boss so that you feel comfortable with the conversation. So saying things like, um, I just wanna let you know that um, I have to take this time off to take care of my mental health so I can show up to work being my best self. Um, I just wanna let you know, is there anything that I need to do in order to make that possible? I recognize that not everyone works in a job that provides them with that flexibility, but really thinking about what do you need to include in your day to day to take care of your mental health and to communicate that to other people and to think about what are the words that I can use that I feel most comfortable with when I'm communicating this. And this could be a great way to establish boundaries with people so that you can prioritize your mental health. So a lot of people don't know how to talk about their condition, how to set boundaries, but I think it's really important for us to, to think about how important that is as it relates to taking care of yourself mentally. Yeah, that's a brilliant insight. And I love how you brought it into the workplace as well, because sometimes we think it's only at home or in our personal lives where we have to have these conversations, but having them at work can be as challenging, if not more difficult sometimes, because it gets linked to performance, it gets linked to our reviews, it gets linked to how we how we feel, operate and work and how we're perceived in the workplace, which can be And I think for so many people, one of the things I'm noticing is I think people are worried about, so we talked about this earlier, but people are worried about social media use and phone use on our mental health. And it's an interesting conversation because it's almost like, we're all always going to use our phones and technology. It's gonna be hard to never, we're on our phones right now doing this to even share this message. And so when you're talking to people about social media use and phone use, what are some of the insights that you think people can take away that will benefit them when it comes to managing their mental health and well-being in a way that's real and practical with the world we live in today? That's right, right. because the reality is we are connected to our devices. We are connected to each other via social media. And so completely eliminating that because you think that is the cure for your mental health condition is a little uh, short-sighted because that's like telling someone, oh, you have to stop using Google. You can't use Google at all. You can't use this search engine. You wouldn't be able to function. 
So I think it's important to figure out ways in which you can leverage the this tool that is quite powerful, that is social media, that is having access to your cell phone in a way that serves you well, in a way that allows for you to be emotionally healthy and strong. And so when it comes to social media, being connected and staying informed is important while at the same time set boundaries on how often you're checking your phone or how much time you're spending on social media. So create a, a commitment to yourself. And this is a great month to do that as we're thinking about a mental health reset in ways to say, you know, I'm going to commit myself to spending 30 minutes a day on my, my phone, browsing different websites so I can stay in form of the news, going on social media so I can be connected to my friends and stick to that and observe how you feel in the weeks that follow, kind of adhering to that boundary of limiting your, your, your screen time. Now, for other people, the phone can also be a source of anxiety and stress because people are reaching out to you. They're texting you. You have lots of emails. You're looking at your inbox. And you're like, my goodness, how am I going to respond to all these messages? Do so in small chunks because looking at the inbox, looking at the unresponded text, it could feel overwhelming. But if you say to yourself, you know, I'm going to answer the phone two times today. I'm going to send 10 emails and you stick to that. That's powerful because setting these small measurable goals can make you feel more confident in your ability to take care of your mental health. And also you'll have more time to prioritize you to do the things that you enjoy that's separate from your phone. Absolutely. Dr. Christine Crawford, thank you so much for all your insights today, all your great energy. I mean, I think everyone listening to you is feeling a boost just from your positivity. It's, it's contagious. I love it. And I think you've shared so many great practical insights. And again, I want to make sure that if you or anyone you know is struggling with their mental health, of course, have the conversations as Dr. Christine guided us on how to have those conversations, how to have them in the workplace. But please do go to www.nami.org forward slash help so that you can find the resources. I've pinned the link to the top of the comments. I highly recommend it. It's really hard to see that so many people are suffering and dealing with mental illness for so much more longer before they reach out for help. And often, if we reach out for help early enough, we'll find the resources, we'll find the support, and we can start to heal. And so I really, really hope that you and your family and friends will take advantage of this. Dr. Christine, are there any more words of wisdom, any inspiration that you'd like to share with us that you'd like everyone here to know? Yeah, I thank you for creating this opportunity to talk about mental health because mental health is part of overall health. And you can feel so powerful if you just take the time to prioritize your emotional well being. And you're not alone in this. So certainly check out the resources that are available at NAMI.org. And thank you, thank you so much, Jay, for this amazing conversation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Christine. So grateful to you and NAMI. And again, everyone here, nami.org forward slash help. That's the address to visit straight after this live to check out all the resources and services that NAMI has to offer that can help you or your family or your friends uh, or anyone in your life that you may have come across recently that may be struggling uh, with mental health. And so please do that. It is Mental Health Awareness Month. Use it as an opportunity to reach out to a friend, to connect with someone to get into nature, to exercise, to sleep better, to start a new moment every single day that's going to support your mental health. And you can find more at the NAMI uh, page as well. So please do that. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Christine. I'm so grateful for your time and energy. Thank you to everyone who stayed with us. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.